Our next speaker is Peter Collins, and he's the collections manager at the Waterways Trust. Okay, over to you. Hello there, sorry. I was busy working out your hoop <laughs> system, technology specialist, seems to um, Yeah, I'm Peter Collins, I'm from the Waterways Trust, and just to you know, we um, look after three uh, waterways museums, one being National Waterways Museum, this talk will be focusing on, um, there's one at Gloucester, so Gloucester Waterways Museum, and the Canal Museum Stoke Bruin, and my collections go across those um, worlds. We are also um, become part of a new um, charity uh, called the Canal and River Trust, and we'll be coming responsible for collections at Stanage Visitor Centre, very exciting, recommend visiting, and also Anderton Boat Lift as well, which thankfully won't come into my collections, it'll be an operational object, thankfully. So that's quite a complicated piece. So my, my talk is going to uh, focus on um, uh, particularly uh, an ethical dilemma that we have in the uh, museum world particularly, but also in, in many of the other heritage organisations' disposal. Um, but to give you a context of where, where we were, um, we as many industrial museums collected a lot of items, 1970s, 80s, particularly a lot of wooden boats, also metal boats and, and large metal objects, um, in various states of repair, uh, open it. And um, over the years, um, a number of those got restored, particularly un in the mid-80s under a particular government initiative called the Manpower Scheme. Mr. Heseltine was very keen up our way. He uh, thought it was a way to stop people in Liverpool rioting, fixing boats. So we did a lot of work then. But then, of course, we had the problem that we had lots of money, and then it all went. So then we had the dilemma of how we actually maintain those vessels. So over a period of time, we, uh, we looked at maintaining them through ways that we actually could uh, look after them, uh, which was quite difficult for ourselves. But also we, um, we looked at doing HLF bids, um, large-scale projects, which then, of course, we doing uh, HLF, as some of you realise, it precludes you from doing some work actually to the object, so you have to wait for that money. So it, becomes, uh, it, it became quite a, a difficult conundrum. And this uh, vessel, Ethel, uh, sums it up quite excitingly. It's a, a Leeds and Liverpool barge. You're very excited by that. It's actually in sections at the moment. There's the bow here. I could use a laser guide to point it out. It would take me a while to work out. So what did we look at doing? We, we had a, um, in the early 2000s, or noughties, I think, as you would call it now, I think, uh, in, in sort of 2006, we looked at a process called Old Boats, New Life. And we started to investigate those collections start reviewing what the, those collections are, what the significance of those objects, what the states repair, what other vessels um, are out there, because vessels were particularly a, uh, a problem with on our collections. And my collections cover across, as many of the other curators and, and people here, of course, lots of other stuff, but um, vessels are the biggest conundrum. So we did a, a big investigation funded through um, something called the Designation Challenge Fund, um, and we categorised the boats based on importance, significance, and also about where those vessels could potentially be in the future and is there a home with ourselves or is there a better place for them. And this excitedly um, uh, small picture uh, that you can see here is um, a way that we're then looking at dealing with those objects. So one of the processes we are looking at, we're looking at conservation, we're looking at restoring our vessels, we're looking at maintaining those vessels, but also we're looking at, with a development of a wide boat strategy, should we be thinking of deconstructing some of those vessels? Some of these vessels we're looking at, this particular one here is an excellent example. I use a finger pointing, Cornish way. Uh, is absolutely totally rotten. When we actually will, if we manage to get it out of the water, which would be quite a conundrum in itself, there will actually be very, very little left. The timbers literally have, when you talk of returning back to its natural state, this is back to its natural, it is, it's, it's not quite coal yet, but it's, it's really, really dire. Um, and so way we're looking at, rather than just restoring them, um, making an, an exciting object for the future, we have to then look at maintaining those vessels. So one way we're looking at, if you look at this slightly small picture here, is an archaeological dig. So in a lot of practices always already been established in uh, industrial heritage is about deconstruction. Can we take those elements apart? Can we look at a, a, a way of disposing? Can we retain some of those features that are integral to that object? But when we're taking them apart, can we record? Can we assess? Can we assess significance? Can we use drawings? Can we produce drawings that from them we can make a replica in the future? That, that sort of way of doing it. The knowledge in, those, uh, in, in that way is retained. Um, there's an exciting publication, particularly in, in the maritime world, through National Historic Ships UK, as they are now, um, reflecting the entire United Kingdom, called Conserving Historic Vessels. And that ad addresses that process and gives you, almost gives an, uh, a, a, an ethical way that you can actually do that process. Uh, it's 
it's enshrined in there, but it's a practice that we, as particularly industrial heritage, we've already done this pro COI. That ethyl white boat I, uh, you had seen earlier, I, on my watch, that's been uh, broken up. And I well, uh, fortunately, that had to use a JCB to break that because it was so complicated and they contaminated as a load. So, where for us? So, what we're looking at as a uh, part of our strategy of going forward, we are looking at deconstruction of some of our vessels. We're looking at maintaining some of those vessels, restoring some of those vessels. Some of those vessels are operational, some of those are static. We're looking at um, uh, heritage lottery bids, for instance, to um, conserve uh, two of the particular wide boats, which are um, the ones you saw illustrated on the side there, but also um, doing um, restoration of operational vessels. This boat here, an exciting narrowboat called Mendip, did a, an excellent trip to uh, Birmingham last year, paid for by the... Um, uh, shows you should uh, always look, uh, have your money in your back pocket ready, from Cadbury's, or Kraft Foods, is their name now, because this used to carry chocolate crumb for uh, Cadbury's. I certainly wouldn't have eaten the chocolate crumb that it carried in the large <coughs> hole there. But it shows you, we, we are looking at, as an operation vessel, that has an important significance in our collection. You know, should we maintain all those? Because we actually have three other vessels of a similar type to that. Or should we keep all of those? That, that's a question we, we really want to uh, adhere to. And uh, within time... That's me. Look at Thank that. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, uh, Rachel Cockett is going to respond to that and with her MA ethics hat on as well. So, over to you, Rachel. Um, for the way you've really explained what you're doing and how, you, how you've done it, um, did you use the MA code of ethics? We did, yeah, and uh, um, we obviously are a, a proper accredited uh, museum as well. But yeah, we, we have um, larger conservation policies and, and the code of ethics. And part of that process, that reason why we haven't quite gone down the um, route yet is because we're looking at benchmarking those collections against other things. So where we can assess those significant art should, has other people got examples of that type? And that, that's something that is that process we're going down at the moment. And in looking, the deconstruction is really that, that last resort, is that the, the best way forward for those objects? We're obviously doing it in a managed way. Um, what I was really struck by is actually how you're actually doing this, because a lot of people talk about doing this, and it's going ahead. You've divided your vessels into different groups, and you're acting on it. And for me, it's just seeing a museum getting on with doing that. I was quite interested with the destruction. Um, is that a public thing? And you said you record, obviously, what you find, and you're using it to sort of develop and increase the knowledge you've got about the boats. It, 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 is, it is exactly. If we did um, the slightly unusefulness of our particular this site that we're based at Owensmere Port is the fact that we had no cubby holes to hide anything away. Some of the good things of uh, previous base I've worked, I had places to hide, um, but we, we don't have anywhere to hide, so we, which is a good thing in our book because we would look at making that as telling people exactly what we're doing, why we're doing it, and the processes that we're doing, and make, of course, the information that we gather from that publicly accessible as well. Yeah. I actually think it's, from what you've said, it sounds like a great model. I don't really have anything else to add, because you're well, There's far too it. much agreement going yeah. on here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. OK, uh, we'll go to Sharon first, and then behind you. Sharon Robinson, Museum of London. I'm going to agree as well, because Museum of Good. London <laughs> found themselves in a very similar position with um, a floating grain barge. I, I, know what you mean. I tried to give it to you. You wouldn't have it. Hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, now I say, no, I'm all right, thank you. I've got enough boats at the moment. Always over to office. It's called Perseverance. It was a bit like Ethel, but without the grass. It's the, 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 that's water, right, yeah. But only just. Um, we costed the restoration to be in the region of £300,000 just to get it in good floating condition. Mm. It was going to cost us tens of thousands of pounds a year just to keep it in good condition once we'd invested that much. And that was at the expense of the rest of the collection. And we talked to the National Historic Ships Commission about the deconstruction process. And we were on the verge of going about that when the National Trust took it off our hands. And <laughs> one, of the reasons <laughs> one of the reasons that they did this was because it was moored on their property. Mm. And every yeah. other Saturday, they'd phone me up and say, your boat's sunk again. OK, shout. <laughs> so hey, yeah, yeah, have a so it was time. bad for them, it was bad for us. Um, but what I wanted to say was the deconstruction process I don't think has been formally um, undertaken. Mm -hmm. And at the time, two years ago, the National Historic Ships Commission were very excited about the fact that somebody might do it. 
And also there is a cost implication in that, and I think mm. the uh, cost of deconstruction to be about seventy thousand pounds. Yeah. 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 But what else can you do? I thought for, for us it was the responsible thing to do, and thank goodness the National Trust came to the rescue. Okay, it, it, it can we? Can you just because you're just going to agree with her, I think. So can we just move? <laughs> <laughs> can we just move I was it on? Say they were very silly. Very long, very <laughs> Uh, Robert Turner of Euro Conservation, uh, not necessarily going to disagree either, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Chair, but I do have a question, and that is, how do you decide between deconstruction, conservation, restoration, or using in a working mode? And I ask particularly, given that if you look over the last maybe 20 years of how we as a nation have allocated our very scarce resources for looking after historic ships, um, there aren't very many people who would say that there's unanimity about the fact that those resources have been allocated wisely. Shall I try and put it delicately like that? Um, so I think it's quite tricky, and I just wondered if you actually had some kind of decision-making process within your trust that allowed you to come to conclusions. We, we assessed, it, um, and we are going through a process of assessing those vessels for their significance and importance, particularly the um, old boats, new life, where we talk about, particularly in museums, mm -hmm. we do a lot of uh, uh, pontification, we like ordering, structuring things then actually doing something from that. That's the sort of difference that we're doing now. Um, we had approach of benchmarking with other collections. So what we're looking at with some of those vessels, for instance, we, we have a, a vessel that we're looking at benchmarking with the National Trust so that they look after it. Rather. Okay. We have uh, it's that, mm -hmm. that sort of process that we're going down, talking to your peers, but also if that deconstruction process gives you an element of recording and assessing something where some of those vessels we're looking at Literally, if we do the work on them, they will be a total restoration of nothing left of the original object themselves. So you know, where you, you're making a replica in that regard, so, mm. which we then can't afford to maintain. So. Okay, we have um, <laughs> another response. Yeah, Louise Lawson-Tate, just ask a slightly more difficult question. How would you feel if the significance of an item that you deconstructed changed so it became more significant than you'd originally thought, if more information came to light? Uh, I would uh, answer that with the, the usefulness of doing a politics <laughs> degree. Uh, that uh, you can only do, you can only take you. You're taking a snapshot. I think we've talked about already about the conservation analysis. You take a snapshot in that period. I think that's always going to be a real conundrum in that that significance may change because that vessel that you've benchmarked against may then sink or uh, may may then deteriorate in the future. I think what you have to do is make sure you do everything you possibly can to benchmark. And of course, using that recording structure as well, particularly on vessels like this. We, we will be able to make a new, that knowledge that you gain, particularly, obviously the personal story is not that term, it's lost, but the actual technical details are Okay, changed. Jane wants to respond. You might want to hope that your deconstruction does change the significance in the way that our archaeological excavation often changes the significance of the site. Yes, sure. um, Don't see it as a negative thing, see the deconstruction as part of the process. Yeah, it's, it's part of the story of that object. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Peter, we need to move on to the next speaker. Thank you.